My name is Jakob Edelstein. I am a Czechoslovak Zionist and the first Jewish elder in the notorious Theresien Stad Ghetto. I was born in Horodenka, Galicia and went to Bohemia as a refugee during World War I. I first joined the Social Democrat Youth Movement there and then the Zionist Movement. From the early 1930s I was one of the leaders of the Labour Zionist Movement in Czechoslovakia, a member of the Presidium of the Nationwide Zionist Federation and Director of the Palestine Office of the Jewish Agency in Prague. Then came the invasion of Bohemia and Moravia by Nazi Germany in 1939, which changed everything. I became a central figure of the Zionist movement and of Jewish life in the Nazi protectorat. In the fall of 1939 I visited a group of Jewish deportees AT Nisko in the Lublin area and reached the shocking conclusion that in most cases deportation of Jews to the East meant their death. So, in order to avoid the deportation of the protectorate as Jews, I actually suggested to the Nazis establishing a labor camp for US within the protectorate that would employ the Jews to further the economic needs of the occupying power. But that camp turned out to be Theresienstadt. The establishment of the ghetto in Theresien was in some ways due to my initiative. Was I guilty of collaboration? of creating a joint venture with the Nazi murderers? Or was I simply trying to do my best for our people? It's important to point out that the Czech territories were a protectorate, close to and allied to the Reich, but not directly occupied. The city of Theresien was about an hour and a half drive north of Prague. It was part of a fortress built by Emperor Josef II between 1780 and 1790 and named after his mother, Empress Maria Theresa. It was constructed for protection against invading armies, though it was never used in that capacity. It consisted of two distinct sections, a small fortress used as a prison since the early 19th century, and a large fortress which became the garrison town named Theresen. The so-called protector of Bohemia and Moravia was none other than the notorious Reinhard Heydrich, soon to be a key player in Nazi negotiations with the Jews of the region. The first thing to understand is that in Czechoslovakia, we Jews were very assimilated. Yet we maintained great respect for Jewish tradition. In Prague, there were a great many synagogues, sometimes six or seven per street. Children received a good Jewish education in German. They went to synagogue and afterward to the opera. But they didn't see any contradiction in that. In other words, we were highly assimilated but still respected Jewish tradition. In due time, however, the situation became as bad for Jews in the protectorate as in Germany and Austria. In 1939, everyone knew what was going on in Germany and Austria. It was then and only then that Jews became broad Jews in every sense. The new reality was of course a shock, but we had to cope with it. Of course, for the children, new challenges arose because, for the first time, they actually began to worry about their identity. Bear in mind, there were no Jewish schools, except for Jewish children who wanted to emigrate to Israel. But the only organized group among the Jews was Zionist in orientation. Being the leader of the Jewish community in Prague, I encouraged the children to advance their education, especially since emigration soon became impossible. Teachers moved from one apartment to another, holding classes during the morning hours. In the afternoon, the Zionist Youth Movement organized activities for the children. Jewish groups met in an old soccer field, since Jews were not allowed in public parks. Every afternoon they went to the field, played games and heard lectures. They belonged to various youth movements, including Hashomer Haatzer, Dror and the religious Zionists. The object was to make being Jewish feel good and positive. 
i výhat tovar dejelou star Let It Shine. And together we discover that it is great to be Jewish. My name is Egon Redlich, do people called Megonda. I was among the Zionist leaders nominated by Jakob Edelstein, becoming responsible for all Jewish education. I was known for being very strict, promoting the highest standards among Orient people. I wrote articles, gave lectures and organized cultural evenings. I wanted to leave Czechoslovakia and set up a new home in Palestine. I had studied law at the Charles University, but during the dark period of the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, I had to leave my law studies and focus on my work with the Zionist organization Hahalutz. My name is Freddy Hirsch. I'm originally from the Sudetenland, in Germany. When Hitler came to power, my mother, stepfather, and brother moved to Bolivia. But I stayed behind to continue the work I had begun with children. When I was 19, in 1935, the Nuremberg laws were passed, and I fled to Czechoslovakia. I became active in the Maccabi Hetzer, the Young Maccabees Youth Movement, and the Zionist Hahalutz organization, running summer camps and helping to prepare young Jews to emigrate to Palestine. Despite the Nazi conquest of Czechoslovakia, I continued my work with children, organizing sports activities, camping trips and study groups. I insisted on cleanliness of body and clothing. The Madagascar plan which would evacuate Jews to the French island of the coast of Africa had already been put forth. The Lublin reservation had already been established along with the Lodz ghetto. He in leadership positions knew that the Nazis had evacuation in mind. So in 1939 through early 1940, I started looking for a location where the Jews of the protectorate could be sent without the Germans sending them to Poland. The important thing was for US to stay in Czechoslovakia. At the same time, Heydrich and his people were in discussions about the future of the Jews. In October 1941, a meeting was held in which they decided to send the Jews to a ghetto. I suggested Terezin to the Nazis, who, for better or for worse, agreed. He said to them, everything you want US to do in Poland, we can do here. And that is how the Jews of Bohemia and Moravia ended up here in Terezenstadt. The Jewish youth movement called Hehalus declared that they must go first, since their very name means pioneers. They needed to prepare the place for the rest, especially elderly people, women and children. Theresienstadt really was an exception to the rule on so many levels. In other places, Hehalutz did just the opposite of the wishes of the Jewish council and its leadership, the Judenrat. Here, they cooperated and collaborated. In Poland, the Judenrat was always in conflict with the Germans. Here, just the opposite. In Theresienstadt, only one group, the communist-leaning Hashomer Hatzair, resisted, fleeing Slovakia and joining the underground. In my eyes, Theresienstadt was to be presented as a transit ghetto, a way station for Jews, not to death camps, but to serve as an old age home or convalescent home for Jews 65 and older, and wounded Jews, where they would stay for the time being. It was all a pattern of deception, so they would not suspect what would be coming in the future. In November 1941, the first group was sent in. The place was dirty, as only the army had lived there. Now, Jewish civilians arrived and were shocked. The leaders nonetheless found ways to clean it up. They even obtained some material from the Germans. There was no train station in Theresen, so the people had to make a long walk from the nearest station through the snow, carrying their luggage. When they arrived, they were crowded into barracks. Males and females were separated. Children up to 14 stayed with their mothers. Boys from the age of 14 stayed with the men. There were communal kitchens and, of course, a Jewish council, here called an Altestenrat, that 
took care of assorted needs. In December 1941, I was sent to Teresa instead, becoming deputy to Egon, Gonda, Bradley. New arrivals were allowed to bring with them 60 kilos of personal belongings. They hadn't been hungry yet, so they brought books, photo albums, and musical instruments. Only the pessimists took food. They certainly didn't expect starvation. When they went to register, I arranged to have the young people assist the elderly. The children were enthused. They actually wanted to help the Nazis carry out their plan, seeing everything in a positive light. I made sure the children maintained their hygiene, and helped them continue their studies. They played games and put on plays. I too was sent to the Theresien Ghetto from Prague in December 1941, together with other Jewish leaders who then held important posts in the ghetto as Jewish self-administration. I was appointed head of the Department for Children and Youth, which needed to create tolerable living conditions in the camp for the thousands of children, ranging from newborn babies to adolescents. On January 1st, 1942, I began writing a diary, describing my various and observations. I wrote in Hebrew still hoping to find a new life in Israel after the war. I actually got married in the ghetto and my wife and I had a child. We hoped we would survive the agony of the war that seemed to be coming to an end. All of a sudden, we found our situation precarious. In the summer of 1942, all non-Jews were evacuated. I wanted to continue my activities with the children and asked the Nazis for special homes and a school for them. I started to open children's homes all over town. First for the Czech boys, then the girls, then German children. Fifteen homes in all, from nursery to high school. And they had the best possible teachers, painters, writers, university professors, teachers who volunteered to share what they knew. There were no textbooks, so everyone taught from memory. They even had a chance to hear classical music, performed by the elders, who organized concerts. The children knew nothing about the genocide taking place elsewhere. They felt they were part of an autonomous community that, oddly enough, was flourishing. As for the Nazis, this was a good show for the outside world. They invited international agencies, the Red Cross in particular, to come and have a look. In 1944, when the Red Cross was about to come, the Nazis decided to beautify the ghetto. But by now the reality was that people were dying in the streets. When elderly people were brought into the ghetto, the lack of food grew worse. The bodies of the dead were incinerated their ashes placed in makeshift columbarium, pigeon roosts, converted to ossuaries. The ashes were placed in boxes bearing the name of each victim. But all of this was deception geared toward putting on a good show. In the end, just before the liberation of the ghetto, the surviving children were told to dump the ashes in the river. Other prisoners were reduced to forced labor. For my part, I wanted to separate the children from the ugliness of the ghetto, but I couldn't. The children of course went to see their parents, and could not be shielded from their suffering. In time we instituted a new rule. Each child was to adopt an elderly person, read to them, take care of their needs. At first the children didn't care to do this, but when they saw how much these elderly people appreciated it, they had a change of heart. The time came, however, when the Nazis decided to send the Jews east. Some Jews were able to spare themselves due to their important positions in the ghetto. But when it came to deportation, in the notorious transports, they all went by families. By early 1944, most Danish Jews had already fled to neutral Sweden. But the Danish Jews who stayed behind were also sent to Theresienstadt. At the same time, in Birkenau, a special section was created to receive the Czech Jews. Surprisingly enough, a special children's block was opened at Birkenau. 
and just as surprisingly, we again held classes. We even organized gymnastics. It was almost tolerable, but each prisoner was given an identifying mark. I asked for SB6 for the children. He didn't know that SB6 stood for Sonderbehandlung nach sechs Monate, special treatment for six months, then death. In the meantime, we organized a living library. People recited literary stories from memory. All the while the chimneys were going full blast, with children playing and listening to the stories. And believe it or not, they were reasonably content. Then came March 7, 1944. An announcement was made. Everyone is to proceed to the quarantine camp. In reality, they were going to be gassed. I was told about it by the underground and was asked to lead a resistance. An uprising. I asked, what will happen to the children? The answer was obvious, it would lead to their death. And I said, no, if we have to go, we go together. There is debate about what happened after that. Some speculate that he committed suicide. We'll never know. But in the middle of the night, the Nazis took everyone on trucks to crematorium number three. A survivor recounted, The people resisted. The women and children were beaten and thrown into gas chambers. I had to close the door. But inside, I heard people singing the Czech anthem, the communist anthem, and Hatikva. Even in their last moments, they died with courage and pride. Out of 15,000 children who entered Theresienstadt, only 150 survived. The camp was dissolved in the summer of 1944. Holocaust scholar Yehuda Bauer notes, Of the 139,654 Jews deported to Theresienstadt before April 1945, a scant 16,832 were freed when the ghetto was liberated after the end of the war on May 9, 1945. It is one of the most melancholy yet heroic stories of the entire Holocaust era. It cannot and must not be forgotten.